The Bible is quite clear that the Holy Spirit is active in our world. The book of Acts, which sometimes goes by the longer title of the Acts of the Apostles, could just as accurately be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. After the Apostolic Age, there have been some changes. The Spirit does not inspire further scripture, for example, but he continues to do his work in the world. First, the Holy Spirit does many things in the lives of believers. He is the believer's helper. He indwells believers and seals them until the day of redemption. This indicates that the Holy Spirit's presence in the believer is irreversible. He guards and guarantees the salvation of the ones he indwells. The Holy Spirit assists believers in prayer and intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit regenerates and renews the believer. At the moment of salvation, the Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. Believers receive the new birth by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit comforts believers with fellowship and joy as they go through a hostile world. The Spirit, in His mighty power, fills believers with all joy and peace as they trust the Lord, causing believers to overflow with hope. Sanctification is another work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. The Spirit sets Himself against the desires of the flesh and leads the believer into righteousness. The works of the flesh become less evident, and the fruit of the Spirit becomes more evident. Believers are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, which means that they are to yield themselves to the Spirit's full control. The Holy Spirit is also a gift giver. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. The spiritual gifts that believers possess are given by the Holy Spirit as He determines in His wisdom. The Holy Spirit also does work among unbelievers. Jesus promised that He would send the Holy Spirit to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit testifies of Christ, pointing people to the Lord. Currently, the Holy Spirit is also restraining sin and combating the secret power of lawlessness in the world. This action keeps the rise of the Antichrist at bay. The Holy Spirit has one other important role, and that is to give believers wisdom by which we can understand God. The Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Since we have been given the amazing gift of God's Spirit inside ourselves, we can comprehend the thoughts of God as revealed in Scripture. The Spirit helps us understand. This is wisdom from God rather than wisdom from man. No amount of human knowledge can ever replace the Holy Spirit's teaching. Now, who sends the Holy Spirit into the heart of each individual Christian? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ does. He is still at work. From where does the Lord Jesus Christ send the Holy Spirit from? From God the Father. And into the heart of every person who God has loved for as long as he has been God. At some time in their life, some while they're children, some while they're teenagers, and some even in old age, The Lord Jesus Christ who is in heaven sends the Holy Spirit into their hearts from God the Father. And when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of a man, woman, boy or girl, five amazing things happen. Firstly, he brings about the new birth. A young man once said to me, I cannot understand it. I've been in a Christian home all my life. I've listened to thousands of gospel sermons, attended thousands of church services, and it never meant anything to me. And then one day, he says, it hit him, and he could see it for himself. A change began to happen in him. That's the new birth. It's like starting a new life. You came into this world through a natural birth. You go into the spiritual world through a spiritual birth. Jesus said that in John 3 3 very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again you see for a natural birth it has to be physical because you come into the physical world if you go into the spiritual world it has to be a spiritual birth who can bring a spiritual birth can you no only the Holy Spirit And people are brought into the spiritual world, into the spiritual dimension, to see spiritual things and experience spiritual things by a spiritual birth. 
which Jesus calls being born again or being born from above. According to John 3, 6, that which is born from flesh is flesh and that which is born from spirit is spirit. And being born again isn't something a man or a woman can do for you. Your parents can't do it for you. Your friends can't do it for you. Only the Holy Spirit can bring a person to be born again. And only God, the Holy Spirit himself, brings people into the spiritual dimension, into the spiritual world. You cannot even see the kingdom of God. You cannot even see the spiritual world without the works of the Holy Spirit, which we call the new birth. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit does when he enters you. He gives you the new birth. Secondly, the Holy Spirit having come into our lives, into our affections, into our intelligence, into our emotions, into everything that we are, he actually begins to then live within us. Jesus said this to his disciples. He is with you and he shall be in you. And the mark of a true Christian, the mark of a true born again child of God, is that the Holy Spirit dwells in him or her. And if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, says the Bible, it is because he does not belong to him. Now, many of you before you gave your life to Christ, you may have mixed with Christians and you said to yourself, there's something about him, there's something about her, but you could never put your finger on it. But you didn't have the words or the language to express exactly what they had. And the truth is that the Holy Spirit is what you saw inside of them. And that's what makes a Christian a Christian, the work of the Holy Spirit. And when he's brought us into the spiritual realm, he does not leave us. He lives inside of us. He indwells in us to the point where even our bodies are called in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, the temples of the Holy Spirit. In the Greek language, the shrine of the Holy Spirit. Because as you know, the temple was a big building. But within a big building, there was a holy place. And within the holy place, there was a holy of holies. And that's the word Paul uses to describe your body. So each and every one of you who's a born again Christian, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. God is in you and God is with you. I've got good news for you too. For people who always think they are not worthy to receive this glorious Holy Spirit, this most Holy Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit has come for the best of us and for the worst of us. If you're washed in the blood of Jesus, you qualify. Are you happy? I think this is absolutely fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. Why does the Holy Spirit come? When I was small, in my father's church, my father was a pastor. We give many reasons what we had to do before the Holy Spirit could come. They were of one accord. That meant they were in perfect unity. So we all had to be in perfect unity, perfect unity, perfect unity. Dear me, and that didn't seem to work out. There was always somebody quarreling. So now the Holy Spirit wouldn't come because there was somebody quarreling and the rest had to suffer. That's nonsense. All the conditions we put on people, I say again, be washed in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the qualifying factor. And now, I want to tell you, and I give you the scripture, why we can receive the Holy Spirit. Here it is, John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus speaking here, 
about the Holy Spirit he said to the disciples and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper namely the Holy Spirit that he the Holy Spirit may abide with you forever he didn't say you will pray he said I will pray now we have yet another less feather for our own hat not one thing less to boast it wasn't my prevailing prayer Jesus prayed for me and he prayed for you his prayer will be answered today and you will receive you shall receive you shall receive glory to God Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit will not fall on the floor. He is looking for those who are washed in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And you know what I suddenly realized? I suddenly realized I am a residential address of the Holy Spirit on earth and you are a residential address of the Holy Spirit on earth because he made our bodies to be his temple are you happy yeah. amen he's with us fully with us we don't know we don't need to squeeze the Holy Spirit to come we don't need to bait him or pull him pull him down he is here willingly sent by the Father and by the Son I came to Christ I was baptized in water so I got dunked in the water and after that I read a verse Mark 1 chapter 8 says that Jesus is gonna come baptize you with the Holy Spirit yeah so what does that mean do I need to get baptized again in the Holy Spirit can you help me understand this yeah it's, a, it's an amazing thing it's the very thing that Paul when he was writing talking about is evidence of that which makes us all one body and unified is a thing that is so much controversy and often divides us so you're talking about Mark chapter 1 it's John the Baptist he is uh, being asked who he is what his ministry is and he says listen there's somebody who's coming after me that I'm not uh, willing or I shouldn't be one who stoops down to untie his sandals I'm going to baptize you with water but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit fast forward throughout the entire ministry of Jesus then and in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 Jesus says hey John baptized you with water but not many days from now I'm going to baptize you in the Spirit and so then the next chapter Acts chapter 2 we have this event which is surely the fulfillment of what Jesus was talking about in Acts chapter 1 that is this baptism of the Spirit. And when it happened, it says tongues of fire set on the apostles. It says that they began to speak in tongues, which there'll be another episode that we'll do on the issue of tongues. But the tongues there, it's a very specific word. It's a known language. And we know it was a known language even then in Acts chapter 2 because it says that men heard the proclamation that went on from those apostles in that particular time of day in their native language or in their own tongue. In other words, they understood what was being said, even though they represented many different nations, many different tribes, many different peoples. God got the gospel out to them through the apostles on that day, even though they were uneducated, untrained men, in fluent language that was understood by people. Okay? So that event seemed to be the fulfillment of what Mark said would happen in, in verse 8 of chapter 1, when John the Baptist prophesied that. What Jesus said is about to happen not many days from now. And, uh, and then that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And I'll have to go back and talk a little bit about Acts in just a moment. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says this. It says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, we were all baptized, every believer, and made a drink of one spirit. Okay? And so what Paul's arguing there is that if you're a member of the body of Jesus Christ, the church, 
you have been baptized by the Spirit. Now, why that's important is because many people have had some experience, they believe, separate and apart from a moment when they profess a saving faith in uh, a trust in Jesus Christ, which was their saving moment. They would say that later, separate and apart from that, subsequent to that, they had a some sort of second blessing, which has been commonly confused with the idea of being baptized in the Spirit. Part of the reason they do that is they misunderstand, part, not all, but some of the people misunderstand what was happening in the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. It is descriptive of what God was doing as he was establishing the church. Okay, The question needs to be answered, what's going to happen if Jesus was uh, came to be the Messiah of the Jews and the Jews rejected him and the Jews' acceptance of him was going to usher in the kingdom? Now that the Jews have rejected him, what's going to happen to the kingdom? And uh, what's the relationship with those who are non-Jews, with uh, the nation of Israel? And so a lot of that is being answered in the book of Acts, which is a book that is, again, descriptive of what God was doing, not prescriptive for all time. And, uh, and so what, what you need to understand is in the book of Acts, Jesus was saying, look, you are going to be identified with the Spirit. The works that you've son, seen done in me, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, these will do even greater works than these you will do. And the way you're going to do that is the same way that Jesus was able to do everything, which is by the power of the Spirit, as Jesus lived in relationship with the Father by faith through the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was going to allow his church to do the exact same thing. In 1 Corinthians, Paul's saying, here's one of the problems that's happening in the church. There's disunity among you because you are valuing certain expressions of the gifts. Some of the miraculous or sign gifts that the early church had were, were being more celebrated and um, pridefully, if you will, displayed than others. And Paul's arguing, hey, listen, it's the same spirit at work in all of us. We all have... Uh, different gifts that we should all use for the glory of God, not for our own glory. Our gifts are given to build up the church for the glory of God. The result of being led by the Spirit is, you guessed it, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, let's put a pin in that for a minute. Why is Paul talking about fruit anyway? Well, the Bible uses a lot of agricultural metaphors because they were easily understood by the highly agricultural society of the time. Imagine our faith as a tree with branches that may or may not produce fruit, depending on how well we take care of the tree itself. If we give the tree nourishment, God's word, then it'll grow bigger. If we clear away weeds and insects, sinful tendencies, then we keep the tree healthy. And if we consult a professional gardener, God, then we'll ensure we're on the right track and eventually that tree will produce fruit. All right, now remember what Galatians 5, 22 through 23 said was the fruit of being led by the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These character traits are the results we should see in our lives after receiving the Holy Spirit and tending to our hearts. The Holy Spirit helps us develop these godly characteristics as we live our everyday lives. Our sinfulness produces rotted, poisoned fruit that reflects our sinful nature and hurts us in the end. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit produces beautiful, nourishing fruit that reflects God's nature and will ultimately benefit our lives and the lives of those around us. If you struggle with showing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, it's okay. We will all struggle and fail sometimes. And we can conquer too. Strive for, work for, and yearn for the fruits of the Spirit. Learn to practice obedience to His guidance when you make choices and be open to His input. It might be really, really hard at first, but the results will be worth it. Over time, the Holy Spirit will transform you into someone more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, and gentle. And you'll have control over your words and actions. In the Old Testament, we see different aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. And you talked about the New Testament where one of the most important works of the Holy Spirit is the work of regeneration, by which he, he changes the disposition of our hearts and then dwells within us, never to depart. And he's working within us to work out our sanctification and bring us into conformity to Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, you couldn't be born again in the Old Testament apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did his work of regeneration then as he does now. 
The work of the Holy Spirit indwelt people in the Old Covenant, just as he does now. The work of the Holy Spirit worked towards the sanctification of the saints in the Old Testament, just as he does now. Well, then how can we talk about the Spirit departing from Saul? Well, there was another aspect or dimension of the Holy Spirit that was very important in the Old Testament, which was the charismatic endowment of power from, on God, from God to enable people to perform a particular task or an office. The prophets were endowed from on high. Moses was endowed from on high. The kings, on many occasions, were endowed by this uh, gift of the Holy Spirit to empower them to carry out their work. And when the case of Saul is concerned, the spirit that departs from him is not the spirit of regeneration, but it's that anointing that God had given to him to fulfill his function as a king. Now, that raises the whole question of whether Saul was ever a Christian. I don't think he was. I don't think he was a believer. And it was possible that God would endow or equip people like Samson and the rest with this divine empowerment for their vocation without at the same time saving them. Now, I don't think that happens in the New Testament. I think that's the significance of Pentecost, that we not only receive regeneration and we receive sanctification and we receive indwelling, but we also, from the day of Pentecost onward, receive the anointing of God to carry out our task as believers in this world. In the Old Testament, that anointing was restricted to a handful of people. In the New Testament, it's universal to the whole body. You remember when Moses, when God told Moses to select 70 men that he knew to be elders over Israel, and God took of the spirit that was upon Moses and anointed those 70 to help him. And Joshua objected and said, uh, or, uh, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Moses said, are you envious for my sake? Would that God, that all of God's people would be prophets and that he would put his spirit upon them. And that was just a prayer that Moses had. By the time you get to Joel, that prayer becomes a prophecy where Joel is saying that God would, in the future, in redemptive history, pour out his spirit, not just on 70, but on the whole community of believers. And that's what the significance of Pentecost is, uh, where God now fulfills that prophecy of Joel and pours out that mm -hmm. anointing power upon all. So let's set the scene for the concept of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Jesus has just performed a miracle. A demon-possessed man was brought to Jesus, and the Lord cast the demon out, healing the man of blindness and muteness. The eyewitnesses to this exorcism began to wonder if Jesus was indeed the Messiah they had been waiting for. A group of Pharisees, hearing the talk of the Messiah, quickly crushed any budding faith in the crowd. It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. They said. Jesus disproves the Pharisees with some logical arguments for why he is not casting out demons in the power of Satan. Then he speaks of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. The term blasphemy may be generally defined as defiant irreverence. The term can be applied to such sins as cursing God or willfully degrading things relating to God. Blasphemy is also attributing some evil to God or denying him some good that we should attribute to him. For now, we'll focus on the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit found in Matthew 12:31. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has to do with accusing Jesus Christ of being demon-possessed instead of spirit-filled. This particular type of blasphemy cannot be duplicated today. The Pharisees were in a unique moment in history. They had the Law and the Prophets. They had the Holy Spirit stirring in their hearts. They had the Son of God Himself standing right in front of them, and they saw with their own eyes the miracles He did. Never before or since had so much divine light been granted to men. If anyone should have recognized Jesus for who he was, 
It was the Pharisees, yet they chose defiance. They purposely attributed the work of the Spirit to the devil, even though they knew the truth and had the proof. Jesus declared their willful blindness to be unpardonable. Their blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was their final rejection of God's grace. Jesus told the crowd that the Pharisees' blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is another way of saying that their sin would never be forgiven, ever. Not now, not in eternity. The immediate result of the Pharisees' public rejection of Christ, and God's rejection of them, is seen in the next chapter. Jesus, for the first time, told the disciples things using parables, which confused them. Jesus explained his use of parables, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Jesus began to veil the truth with parables and metaphors as a direct result of the Jewish leader's official denunciation of him. Again, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cannot be repeated today, although some people try. Jesus Christ is not on earth. He is seated at the right hand of God. No one can personally witness Jesus performing a miracle and then attribute that power to Satan instead of the Holy Spirit. The unpardonable sin today is the state of continued unbelief. The Spirit currently convicts the unsaved world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. To resist that conviction and willfully remain unrepentant is to blaspheme the Spirit. There is no pardon, either in this age or in the age to come. The love of God is evident. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the choice is clear. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. First thing I want to talk to you guys about, and this is something we have to lay the groundwork of this, is the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an it. One of the reasons why we grieve him or quench him or make him sad is because we don't realize he's an actual person. He has a will, a personality, and just like a person can be offended, the Holy Spirit of God can be offended. If there's anyone in the world I don't want to offend, that's the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26 says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit coming in one passage they say, passage they say, we don't want you to go. And Jesus goes, I have to go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is again a me, not in it. He said, he will testify of me. So this is a person and notice Jesus said, he's gonna testify about me. One of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to testify and to bring glory to Jesus. And this is why I teach in manifest manifestations of the Spirit. If there's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit that's not bringing honor or glory to Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to Jesus, to use your life and to cleanse, purify, help you, disciple you so that you can look like Christ. And in you looking like Christ, it would bring glory to Jesus. So a couple of things I want to discuss. First of all is quenching the spirit. Let's see where we find that. First Thessalonians 5.19. It says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. So one of the ways we quench the spirit is by not allowing him to do what he wants to do. So if you're a pastor or leader or in a church and you're not allowing miracles to happen, you're not allowing deliverances to happen, you're not allowing him to work in your church, then you are quenching what the spirit is doing in your church. You're quenching the Holy Spirit. And this is one thing that you don't want to do. Pastors, listen closely. You don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you are allowing the power and the presence of God to move in your service. I think we've made a God in our image instead of serving the God that made us in his image. So we don't tell God what to do. God tells us what to do. I tr I've been traveling for 10 years. I passed all the time. We want God to move. We want God to move. And then they give me the schedule and they give God five minutes at the altar. And I'm like, you want God to move in between your 30 minutes of worship, 25 minute sermon, five minute altar call, and you're asking the Holy Spirit to move. And that's how you quench him by trying to tell him to move in your limits, in your time and your schedule. We need to let God as pastors, leaders and believers, let God move how he wants to move. Stop telling him how to move. Quenching him is when you stop the spirit from moving in a corporate gathering. Quenching is literally, think of it as putting out the fire. 
I've been in meetings where the Holy Spirit's moving and a pastor gets up and will either dismiss it or change, you know, what change what the message is being preached or do something different or hey, we're going to do this now and they're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit and they quench it and the spirit of God stops moving. So by despising deliverances, miracles, prophecy, you're actually the Bible says quenching the Holy Spirit. So there's quenching. Now let's look at grieving the Holy Spirit. Now grieving relates to the personal life. So this relates to you. So the quench is the corporate gathering. The grieving is the personal life. And grieving means to make sorrowful, make sad, or cause to suffer grief. Guys, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, making him sad, making him suffer grief. I don't wanna do this to the Holy Spirit. And so let's look at what grieves the Spirit. A couple things I wanna go over and make the Spirit sad. Now, we are so careful to not hurt anyone or make anyone sad around us and be politically correct to everyone, but what about the Holy Spirit? Do we even think that our actions or our personal life decisions could make God sad doing this? I mean, this would change the way we live and think if we understand that our actions could actually grieve the Holy Spirit. And some of you listening, you're gonna see in a minute, you might be just grieving the Holy Spirit. So we guys, we need to read the word of God. The Bible says the word shows us what is wrong about our lives. And so when we read the scripture, let's evaluate our life and realize none of us are exempt from this. A lot of us are doing a lot of these things. So let's look at where we're gonna find the text. Ephesians 4, 29, verses 29 through verses 32. Watch what it says here. Don't use foul or abusive language. This is just, boom, that's what he starts with. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not grieve God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of malicious behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Notice he says, do not grieve the spirit by the way you live. So how do we grieve biblically the Holy Spirit? By our lifestyle, by the choices of what we do, how we talk, how we act. So this shows us there's certain actions that make the Holy Spirit sad. Grieving him is different than quenching because remember, this is our personal action.